Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. to Constitutional Chats with me, Janine Turner. I'm an actress. You can go to JaneneTurner.com and check all that out. Oh, I'm also the founder and co-president of Constituting America with Kathy Gillespie, Tova Kaplan, and Dakari Chapman. Welcome to our Constitutional Chats, where today our hot topic is Federalist Paper 81, the integrity of the rule of law. And our special constitutional guest is Judge Michael Warren. So, Tova and Dakari, you have something you'd like to say, don't you? Yes, thank you, Janine. So we would like to thank our amazing sponsor for this week, Mr. and Mrs. Fenstermaker, um, for their generous support of our organization. We are beyond thankful. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Fenstermaker are great friends of Constituting America, and again, we are grateful for their support. Um, so thank you guys for all that you do. Yes, they bring this to life today. Once again, I'm Janine Turner. I am an actress, JanineTurner.com. You might remember some of my work. I'm also the founder and co-president of Constituting America. And Kathy Gillespie. Kathy Gillespie is the fabulous and oh so wonderful co-president of Constituting America. It takes two wings for a bird to fly. And without Kathy, I would just be flapping around trying to get off the ground. So we are a great team. And Kathy Gillespie is co-president of Constituting America. And she's one of the 16 private citizens serving on the U.S. Semi-Quincentennial Commission, helping to organize the celebration of our country's 250th birthday in 2026. Kathy, go ahead and say hello. Hi, everybody. We're glad that we're, we're glad that you are with us today, and we are excited to discuss this topic with Judge Warren. Tova Love Kaplan. Tova Love Kaplan is 16 years old. I don't know when her birthday is, but she is the most amazing 16-year-old you're ever going to know. She lives in Chicago, Illinois. She currently serves as our National Youth Director for Constituting America and runs the Nath National Youth Advisory Council or the National Youth Advisory Board, which is filled with students who have won our contest over the past 10 years. So Tova's in charge of that, like a CEO of a top 100 um, company in America. She's also won our We the Future contest, which you should check out at constitutingamerica.org three times. The first time was for Entrepreneurial, where she created a marketing plan. PSA, she won again, Know Your Rights, Read the Constitution. And this past year, she went for STEM, where she created an app. And we're currently working with her to get this app up and going on our, uh, well, for the world out there and in the app store. She's passionate about educating and empowering young people to use their constitutional rights. Tova, say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Dakari Chapman is Constituting America's student ambassador. He's 17 years old and is currently a junior full-time college student. He's won Constituting America's We the Future contest twice, once for PSA, where he reminded viewers the Constitution is an American thing, so know it, and that is a billboard across the country right now for Constituting America. And he also won for his very creative, very funny, very colorful, very wonderful man on the street. He had the most, he has the coolest jacket on. I covet the jacket. It's all different kinds of colors. Um, so check it out. I mean, and uh, he's also an actor. He's involved in our National Youth Award, by the way. Um, he's a working actor seen on HBO's The Righteous Gemstones, in Netflix, The Outer Banks. And he also wishes he wants to be an actor, but also a politician. But he says, you really, you know, you kind of need to be an actor to be a politician. Welcome to Kari Chapman. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope you enjoy this wonderful chat that we're going to have today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, should we all rise? I'm going to introduce our special guest, Judge Michael Warren. Um, the Honorable Michael Wilt Warren was appointed to the Oakland Circuit Court in December of 2002. He was named top judge of the decade. Listen to that. Top judge of the decade, 2019, and top judge of the year for 2018. He's 
co-creator of Patriot Week, which can be found on www.patriotweek.org. He also host of he is also host of Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics podcast. Judge Warren co-authored America's Survival Guide: How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our First Principles and History. And he wrote this with his ten-year-old daughter Leah. I did something very similar with mine. Judge Warren also authored several constitutional law surveys for Wayne Law, periodically teaches constitutional law at Western Michigan Cooley Law School, and is the originator of several legal reforms. We'd love to, if we had all the time in the world, we'd love to know what that is. He has received the Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Association of Top Professionals. Judge Warren has written three essays for Constituting America's 90-Day Study, including essays on the 19th Amendment and the history of Michigan statehood and constitution. By the way, check out our 90-day studies at constitutingamerica.org. They, they span 90 days or a little longer, and they're fabulous. Everything from the Constitution to the Federalist Papers to the classics. Um, Okie dokie. So, Judge Warren, Michael Warren, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. Thank you very much. That was a way too long introduction. It's very much appreciated. I love what you guys do at Constitutional America, Constituting America. And Janine, I'm a big fan of yours from way back when you were on TV, but even a bigger fan for what you're doing with your daughter in Constituting America. So it's really a privilege and my honor to be here today to discuss uh, the integrity of the rule of law, the importance of an independent judiciary uh, to our freedoms and liberty. I'm going to start with uh, something that's not in Federalist Paper 90, that number 81. Um, it, it's in the background, but not necessarily in the forefront. And I want to make sure that we all understand this. There are two major systems of courts. There's a federal system, which Federalist number 90, excuse me, 81 is talking about, which at the time didn't exist. Um, and then the state system. And uh, there is a tremendous difference in what each does. Uh, and each one is supreme in its own realm. So we have 50 states, and then there's some territories in Washington, D.C., and state law is um, under the jurisdiction. In other words, the courts that deal with state law are in each state. And uh, the courts that deal with federal law are in the federal system. So when Hamilton was writing uh, Federalist Number uh, 81, uh, there was only state courts. There actually was no system of a federal court. Uh, it was, so think, I mean, it's kind of unimaginable at this time, but we had a constitution that did not have a separation of powers. Um, there was not, there was just basically a legislative branch um, that did everything. There was no, there was a president of, uh, of the Congress, but really not in the way that we have a president today. He basically was just the Speaker of the House, for lack of a better term, and uh, there was no court system. And so all the cases uh, that were disputed were being um, tackled by the state systems. Uh, so that's a, so when Hamilton's writing, they're creating a whole new branch of government. Now in the state system, there's a number of ways that you can become a judge. Um, you can be appointed by a governor and serve a single term. You can be appointed by a governor and then be reappointed. You can be appointed by a governor and then like there's another independent body that kind of confirms that you should get reappointed. You can be appointed by a governor and then you're set for election in a couple of years and the people then decide whether or not they want to keep you. Then you can be appointed by a legislature and reappointed by the legislature. You can have elections, nonpartisan elections. So you're not a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, a Natural Law Party. You just run as a judge. And then they have partisan elections where they say Republican, Democrat, Libertarian. And then there's partisan elections followed by a retention election. So there's all a number of different ways. Federal system's totally different. You have to go all the way to the top to the president. The president appoints you, or excuse me, nominates you for appointment, and then the U.S. Senate has to agree, confirm, that you deserve that seat. So it's a totally different um, animal. In Michigan, where I'm from, um, if there's a vacancy, the governor appoints you, and then you have to stand for re-election, or you can just run, and those are nonpartisan elections. So I don't have an R or a D or anything else next to my name when I stand for election. 
Uh, federal system is totally different. Uh, the tenure is different. So in the states, terms can, can be as short as one year upon your initial appointment to life, depending on, there's a few states they have you stay, serve for life. Typically, it's four to 15 years. Um, and Michigan, it's a six-year term. In the federal system, anyone that becomes a federal judge gets that job for life. So they either have to resign or die. That's, that, that, that's uh, the closest thing we have to nobility today is an appointment by the uh, president and the US Senate to be a, a federal judge. Um, number of cases. Uh, I, I wish this was an open forum. I always like talking to the students directly and, and asking questions. If I had asked the question, how many cases are heard by federal courts, nobody would get this right. I didn't even know it until I looked up 400,000 a year. In the state system of all the, all the states, 100 million new cases are filed in a year. So in my county, for example, we have 20 circuit court judges. And at any given time, I, I have about uh, 300 to 400 cases, it's kind of the average for our judges. And we have all these new cases that are cycling in and being um, in the federal system. Basically, the lawyers like to say you can roll, you know, you can, you, it's like a bowling alley. You can roll your ball down the, the hallway. There's nobody you're going to hit because their dockets are so lighter compared to ours. Um, federal judges, there's 1,700. It sounds like a lot, but in the state system, there's 30,000 uh, across the country. In Michigan, we have seven Supreme Court justices. In the federal system, there are nine uh, Supreme Court justices. The qualifications to be a judge, judge uh, are vary quite a bit. In states, there's often an age requirement. Often you have to be a lawyer for so many number of years, uh, live in the state and be a, a citizen. Federal system, not a single requirement. You could literally be someone in France and be appointed to be a Supreme Court justice in America, not be a lawyer, uh, et cetera. It, it, there's no requirements, which is kind of mind boggling. There are requirements for uh, the House of Representatives, the US Senate, and the president, but not for judges. Um, terms, um, I, I already mentioned, remember you're, if you're a federal judge, you serve for life. Uh, term limits, um, most, no one has term limits, but there's age restrictions. So in the state system, there's a lot of states where if you hit the age of 65, up to 75, you can no longer be a judge. Federal system, you can be as ancient as, uh, as possible. Uh, there is no age restriction. And then to be removed in the states, it depends. Uh, you can, some states, you can be impeached, or all states, I think you can be impeached and removed, but you can be recalled by voters. There's a thing called bill of address, which basically means the legislature and governor say you should be removed, but you don't get impeached. There's tenure commissions, which say if you do something unethical, you can be tossed off the bench. You can lose an election. You can get too old. Federal system, impeachment, and death. That's a great gig. Um, so when Hamilton wrote uh, this Federalist paper, he, now, of course, there were only 13 states, but there was this wide variety of how judges served, and, um, and they were creating this federal system. And so the question was, why do we even have a federal system of, of judges? Why, why do we need, they didn't have it before. And the, the key answer is that we believe in a separation of powers, that when you don't have a separation of powers, in other words, a legislative, executive, and judicial branch, and you put all that into one person, what do you get? You get tyranny. You get a dictator. You have a, a king. Uh, you have a totalitarian um, party or a military junta, whatever it is. If they can control what the law is, how to enforce the law, and what the law means, that's the very definition of tyranny. So the founding fathers had just you know, gotten off the back of uh, the parliament and king. Uh, they, didn't, they don't have an independent judiciary like we do. They thought it was very important to do that. So the Constitution uh, that was proposed in which uh, Hamilton was defending says that the judicial power is vested in one Supreme Court in such inferior courts as Congress may create. 
So that's also interesting because in uh, state systems, it often talks about a court of appeals, uh, the circuit court, the district court, a probate court, they define them, explain who gets elected, how it all works. Uh, federal system, it only, the only required court is the Supreme Court. And how many members serve on that Supreme Court? De decided by Congress. It started with a, with a handful of people and over time has expanded, not defined by the Constitution. Uh, there's an intermediate appellate court. So you have a, you have a trial court, which, which is I am, and if you lose at the trial court, you appeal, and before you get to the Supreme Court, there's another court in between. In, our, in Michigan, it's called Court of Appeals. That's where most, most states call it. And, um, but in the federal system, they call it the circuit court. So it's a little odd. And, um, and they have panels of three people that listen to an appeal from a trial court. And then if you lose at the, trial, at, at the circuit court, then you can appeal to the Supreme Court. But that's all defined by Congress. So the legislature in our federal system has a tremendous amount of power to define even what our judicial branch looks like. If it chose to, it could make the Supreme Court a one justice court and get rid of all the other courts. So there's a lot of power in Congress. That's not true with the states because they define it in their constitution. So why do we need a Supreme Court? Well, first off, as I mentioned, uh, we believe in a separation of powers. Um, but um, it was interesting because in, in the debate in the constitution, there were people that were arguing that the court should be part of Congress. In other words, Congress should control what the meaning of the law is, the meaning of the constitution, the meaning of the legislation. And uh, the founders decided that that was not wise. Now, where did they get that idea? In England, the um, House of Lords is kind of the equivalent of our Senate. People aren't elected there. It's a hereditary thing. They're, they're appointed and they, they keep it for life. And, uh, and it can be passed down uh, throughout families. And they're the final arbiter of what the law means. So you have um, a branch of government dis deciding what the law is. So we decided that was not what we wanted to do, uh, that we wanted not to have a part of Congress or all of Congress be the final decision maker, but to have a separate independent court. So um, uh, again, we wanted to be able to have the law promulgated by the legislature, the Congress, it to be enforced by the president, the executive branch, and then interpreted when there's disputes by uh, the courts. Um, we don't want the legislature to bend the interpretation of the law to mean what they want at any particular time. That subverts the rule of law. So I'm gonna give a real simple example. Let's say the legislature passed a law, the Congress passed a law, and that said that the national speed limit is 55 miles an hour. They actually did that once. And then someone um, challenges that law and there's no US Supreme Court, it just goes to Congress. And they say, you know, um, it should be, you should interpret 55 to mean approximately 55. So if it's 60, 65, that's okay. And then Congress comes under pressure by groups that say, yes, we, we really think it ought to be 60, 65. And then Congress has a vote because it's popular uh, to, to change what the law means without actually changing the law. If you flip it the other way, they could say, we are going to um, not, uh, we believe in free speech. And you write an article that attacks the president, uh, the, attacks the Congress, says uh, it's a terrible Congress, uh, you're, you're uh, abandoning your role, you're, you, you're hurting the rights of the people. And then you say, no, it's part of free speech. And then it goes to Congress. And Congress says, no, that's not free speech. That's not what we meant by free speech. We didn't mean that you could attack us. You see how if, if you merge them together, you can oppress people's liberty and that defines tyranny. So we do not want to do that. We want to make sure that we have a, an independent judiciary that can say, no, the law really means 55 or the law really means there's freedom of speech. And that means you can attack the Congress even if Congress doesn't like it. So that's, that's fundamental to why we need a separate branch. 
Um, we also, it, Hamilton also mentions uh, that um, legislators are not all trained in the law. Um, you know, they, they can be farmers, they can be doctors, they can be actresses, they can uh, be political philosophers, they can be engineers. And then you don't want those folks trying to figure out what the law means. You want to have a separate, you want to have trained people. Now, it's interesting because, as I said before, the Supreme Court doesn't require you to be a lawyer in the Constitution. You're not required to be a lawyer. But practically almost everyone that's been on the Supreme Court has been a lawyer because they have to go through the confirmation process and they figure out, oh, you're not qualified. And so they, they, you don't get the confirmation. Um, and at the time that um, Hamilton was writing and the and Congress, excuse me, the uh, Constitution Convention was debating the, uh, the establishment of a separate judiciary, there were other states, or there were several states, they had a separate judiciary. So they had seen it in practice. They realized how important it was to protecting liberty and the rule of law. Now, there's some dangers. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody's got questions about anything I just talked about. May I, may I step in for two secs? Sure. I just want to make sure with time, time that we get Tova and Dakari and everyone gets to ask a question. So yep. may, I, may I step in? Absolutely. Okay. You've also given us so much information here. I have so many notes <laughs> that I need to back up a little. I need to, I need to like back up a little so I can make sure that I understand and that everyone listening is understanding. Sure. This is, by the way, Judge Warren, fascinating. I mean, you've, you've explained it. I love your comparison to nobility, that, you know, a federal, a federal judge is the closest. It's either uh, impeachment or death. So it's like nobility. Right. It's really, really. Um, okay. I have a lot of questions, and I want to make sure that, that uh, Tova Dakari get a lot of questions. Boy, I thought it was really interesting when you said, you know, 400,000 are filed federally and 100 million are filed um uh, within the states, um, but and I wanted to know how many are actually heard. But but let me just back up a little bit. Talk to us, okay? It's interesting also that you don't even have to be a lawyer to to be a judge, a federal judge. It's really interesting. I guess I have hope. <laughs> Joking. That's you right. Never want me to make it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but I I think that um, talk to us about. And you talked you talk about the separation, the separation. Uh, what I find, okay, there are two things. And then I want the, the kids to ask questions. One is the Supreme Court is all that's mentioned in the Constitution. So break down for us how many, when, when the other courts were created. Um, I know now we have district courts. You know, this is the 19th district or the 9th district court is always, you know, talked about. We have different dis, district courts, I believe, right? So okay. break down, it was the Supreme Court and now how many courts we have. So also, how people, why would they want to take it to a federal court instead of a, a state court? That's my second question. And the, the third question would be, when, a, when a, the legislature passes a bill that is questionable, does the Supreme Court automatically step in and say, whoa, 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 wait, or does uh, something have to be filed with the Supreme Court? That, that, that asks them to look at the law because Chief Justice Marshall, you know, came in and tried to say that the, the federal court was, uh, the Supreme Court was all about, you know, making sure everything was constitutional. But, but I, don't, I don't think Americans understand that, that connect. There's a disconnect. So let's say that passed a bill that's not constitutional. The court, the court doesn't really step in. There ha Kathy was somebody said that has to actually be filed, but I don't really understand how that works. And I don't think the American people do. Either. All right, fair enough. So that, those are great questions. I appreciate it. So the first thing is that the court is often called the weakest branch of government. And why is that? Because courts don't create their own cases. They cannot say, hey, you passed um, this law about, let's say, uh, DACA. That's one of the big things, right? Um, deferred action for you know, through Obama and Trump and all this and, and, and raise their hand and say, oh, you know what, that, that's unconstitutional. We're going to stop it now. There were suggestions that uh, before a piece of legislation became effective, it would go through kind of a gauntlet of a court uh, before it was uh, effective and, and they rejected that. So there has to be what's called a case or controversy. So there has to be somebody that brings a lawsuit that, and, and then it goes to eventually up, 
up the ladder to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court hears very few cases of what we call original jurisdiction. So most cases are not filed immediately with the Supreme Court. They have to go through the, the other courts. And so you asked about what are the other courts. So there are 94 district courts. So a district court in the federal system is your local court. So um, in Michigan, and I'm sorry, I keep going back to Michigan is what I know. We have an Eastern District of Michigan and a Western District of Michigan. And so we divide the state basically in half and each side of the state has a district court and they're, they're basically a trial court. You file a case, you need, uh, almost everything has a, either a bench trial, which is there's no jury or a jury trial with, with a jury. Somebody loses and they wanna appeal. Then they go up to a circuit court and there are 12 circuit courts. And I, I, if I shared screen with you, you could see, you mentioned the ninth district court. You might've been meaning the ninth circuit court. That's basically most of the West of uh, you know, California, Oregon, Washington. And um, some, case, some circuit courts have a different flavor. So the ninth circuit is uh, well known for what we might call more progressive or, um, uh, liberal decisions. And then when a party loses at the circuit court and they want to appeal, they submit it to the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court only takes a very, very small number of cases. They only have to hear cases that they have original jurisdiction from. But basically it means like there's a foreign nation involved or, or those kinds of things, very limited. So they have a decision to decide whether or not they want to hear a case. And that often you hear this word certiorari or cert. That's an old Latin term, which means we're asking for the court to hear it. And the court then decides whether or not they want to hear it. So they hear maybe a couple hundred cases a year. Um, and um, I'm sure somebody will point out my numbers wrong, but it's a small number of cases compared to the thousands and thousands and thousands of cases. Uh, that are filed um, across, you know, there's 400,000 each year that are filed in the federal system. You figure out which court you go to based on what kind of law is at issue. So, for example, if you're um, arguing over a federal law like Social Security, immigration laws, um, banking laws, bankruptcy laws, you go to a federal court. If you're accused of uh, armed robbery or rape or murder, that's almost always going to be a state court because there is no federal murder law. Um, there's some, there are federal criminal laws, but uh, they're, they're very limited scope compared to the, to the uh, state system. So it depends on what the nature, sometimes you have a choice, but that's pretty rare. Usually, you know, uh, 999 out of a thousand, you have to go to federal court or you have to go to state court. I, ho I hope I answered all your questions. Yes, okay, so 94, what we call circuit courts. Uh, no, district courts, 94 district, 12 okay. circuit, 12 circuit. So circuit, six circuit first Dis circuit, yeah. Di 94 district yes. and the other, in again? Uh, there's, not, there's 12 circuit courts. So the circuit courts have, circuit. In the judicial districts, they have many judges. So they might have 20 judges in any district. And the, and the circuit courts also have a, a, a pool of judges, but many less than the district courts have. Okay, but a district court and a circuit court are federal courts. Well, in my, so in Michigan, for example, we have district courts too. And that would be like my local city, your local community, that's the district court and they handle misdemeanors, traffic, small claims, uh, things under 25, controversies under 25,000. Then we have a circuit court. In my circuit court, I have a county and I have like 1.3 million people that live in my county and I deal with felonies. Uh, so uh, rape, murder, um, uh, all, you, know, you think of a felony, I got those. And then controversies of $25,000 or more. And then we have a court of appeals and then we have a Supreme Court. So. It's a little confusing because the same terminology okay. means different things. Yeah, okay, but the court circuit court and federal court. Okay, Tova, go ahead. I could, it's, this is really fascinating. Yeah, thank you. This has been such a great talk. It's honestly, we really don't learn that much about the judicial court in comparison to the legislature and the you know executive branches. So this is really great. Um, 
I was wondering, so in our previous discussion of, you know, Supreme Courts last week, and also um, in the essays that Constituting America has published, um, I, I saw a phrase come up a lot, which is activist courts, kind of people using that phrase as a way to say that, um, you know, the current Supreme Court has may or may not have like strayed from what its original purpose was and become, you know, an activist court. And I was just wondering, I wasn't really sure what that meant. Could you define what that is, give your opinions on whether or not you feel like it's become an activist court and basically how you think that the Supreme Court has may or may not have strayed from what its original purpose is. All right, so I have to do one caveat, which is as a, as a lowly county circuit court judge, the Supreme Court's always right, okay? So I, I have to follow what they say. But you ask an excellent question, Tova. So the question is, is um, judicial activism versus uh, other ways of interpreting the Constitution. So most people, when they say judicial activism, what they mean is that the court is acting in a way that they, um, that is not in accordance with the original understanding of the Constitution or the original understanding of uh, a, a legislative enactment, a, a law that was passed. So um, I will use an example from history, which will not get me in trouble, okay? Um, you probably have heard of the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott is, was a slave who was brought into a free territory and then brought back to slave territory, black, back to a slave state. And he sued and said, when I was brought to the free territory, I should have been freed because the, the territory said um, slavery was illegal. And so when I went there, I should have been freed. And the Supreme Court in a terrible decision made a ruling that um, said that not only was he not free, but that it would be illegal for territories to outlaw slavery if you already had a slave and brought him in. And that was, a, that was completely opposite of the understanding of the founding fathers when they passed the Constitution because um, there was no protection for slavery in territories. It was well understood that territorial governments would be able to outlaw slavery. Everybody operated that way for generations. And then the Supreme Court under his name was Chief Justice Taney, who is a Southern sympathizer uh, with slavery, uh, decided to change the rules of the game and ignore all that history and make the Constitution say something it didn't. And then he also basically said the Missouri Compromise uh, was unconstitutional, which again, nobody thought it was unconstitutional. Everybody thought that was fine. And he, that was a big jolt towards the Civil War because we could not fix the issue of slavery through the political process state by state anymore he, because he had made it a constitutional right. And he also argued that no black person could possibly be a citizen, um, even though that was obviously untrue, that the founders, you know, from the beginning of the revolution on, uh, believed that African Americans could, you know, if they met other requirements, could be citizens. So it was a terrible decision, unrooted in the law, unrooted in the text of the Constitution, unrooted in the history. So he was being judicially active. He was getting to a policy outcome that he wanted. Uh, not what the Constitution required. Sometimes people refer to this as being um, a living Constitution or uh, going with the spirit of the Constitution. And Hamilton actually writes in Federalist Number 81 that uh, that's, a, lack of a better term, a red herring. It's a false argument. We, he says, nowhere in the Constitution does it say the judiciary should be interpreting the Constitution in light of its spirit. He says that they should be enforcing it based on what, what it meant uh, at the time. And, um, and, and nowhere uh, should the, the Supreme Court subvert the Constitution or expand it or change its meaning based on some kind of spirit argument. It should be based on its original intentions and understanding. This is a long uh, academic argument that has been going on for um, basically since the founding, uh, but there are, um, it, it's really raised its head the last couple of terms in the Supreme Court because there are some decisions where people are accusing the Supreme Court of being judicially active. Again, as a lowly circuit court judge, I'm not gonna opine about whether or not those critiques are right or not, but 
there there is a significant amount of um, uh, of challenge to that, and you you often hear the courts talked about as conservatives versus liberals. I I, I don't think that's a good distinction um, because if you're true to the meaning, it, you might have a very liberal policy outcome or a very conservative policy outcome. You just follow where the Constitution leads you. And if you don't like the answer of the Constitution, then you amend it. Um, and that's the way that you fix the Constitution. So, and, and we've done 27 amendments. It's very difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, and, and that way, the people are still in charge, not people in black robes who stay there for life, who can't get removed. Um, that's very undemocratic. Um, and so the idea is people should, uh, the judges, to protect the rule of law, have to put aside their own personal desires. And they may come up with a policy decision that they hate. Now, I'll give you an example of my, my own courtroom. Um, in my own courtroom, if you are convicted of uh, three operating while intoxicated cases, driving while intoxicated, you must serve 30 days in jail. That's a lifetime requirement. So if you do it, you could be a 16-year-old, a 35-year-old, and a 90-year-old. And you hit the 90-year-old, he's got to go to jail for 30 days. It doesn't matter that it's been 45 years since his last conviction. I have to do that. And there's a number of other things where... There's mandatory penalties. And I don't get to say, well, I don't like that penalty. I don't think it's fair and just in this. People that are uh, more judicially active might say, well, you know, the spirit is if you do it within a certain amount of time within your life, then it, but that's, that's not how it works. So I have to put aside my own personal feelings and do what the law requires. Okay, that's really, really fascinating. Uh, Tova, I hope to get back to you, if we kind of keep all of our answers short. But I, I think what's really fascinating is states uh, during the, the Dred Scott and all those decisions that were made with, by the Supreme Court then, the, they took it, the, the states could no longer resolve it because they made it a federal issue. And I think that's really, really, really thought provoking. And it's happened a lot. Didn't fix it either. It was both the states yeah. and Congress, it was the combination. Yeah, re really interesting. Okay, uh, Dakari. Uh, yes, sir. This has all been so interesting. I'm sorry for my my in and out, it's been a busy day. Um, but I've been listening and like I said, it's been fascinating. And my question is, you know, this seems all very complex. And um, are there any other countries um, or territories that, you know, use our same system or a system close to it um, when it comes to the courts? Um, and I was as appalled as Janine was when you said that you didn't have to be a lawyer to be a judge. Right, so uh, to, to be a Supreme Court justice, you don't have to be um, a lawyer. Uh, Michigan, I have to be, you have to be a lawyer for five years, so it changes from state to state. But any federal judge, you don't have to be, uh, you have to be a lawyer. Um, it's interesting, I, I, I think we are the system that is, uh, I'm pretty sure we're a pretty unique system. I haven't sat down and gone through the uh, the court systems for each country to figure that out. That's, that's a great research project. Um, I, I do know that we're one of the few, or we were one of the first, they had a system where what we call judicial review, which is the independent judiciary, strikes down a law of the legislature based on its violating a constitutional provision. So let's say the legislature says, um, anyone named Tova and Dakare have to, um, uh, you know, go to, go to prison immediately. You got that name, you go to prison, period. Um, that would be unconstitutional, violates due process, all kinds of other laws, and the Supreme Court or a lower court would strike that down and say you can't enforce that. A lot of other countries don't have that. They don't have that power of judicial review. Um, England literally just adopted it within the last couple of years. They're separate, going away from the House of Lords and, and creating an independent judiciary, but we are pretty unique. I also think that the lifetime tenure is also very unique from the systems that I'm aware of. It's usually a, a limited, like a, a time period of 10, 15, 20 years, something like that, but not for life. Okay. Um, I want to come back to Tova Dakare, but uh, Kathy? Well, thank you, Judge Warren. This has been fascinating. And we've got some great audience questions. 
And uh, Pablo Villavazo asks, how many states have ruled state term limits as unconstitutional and has this been done in Michigan? And you may not know, you know exactly how many, but are you familiar with states ruling uh, term limits as unconstitutional? I, uh, does he mean legislative term limits? Probably, yeah. Okay, so my understanding, first off, um, I, I know that the Supreme Court of the United States struck down congressional term limits, finding that it wasn't within the Constitution and that states could not um, change how, uh, couldn't disqualify people because they had term limits. Um, Michigan has a system where in our Constitution we have term limits and by definition um, it can't be unconstitutional, the Constitution allows it. Um, so the, I, I think that there are some, um, I don't know of any uh, states that have struck down their own constitutionally imposed term limits on either judges or uh, legislatures. So if there is, I'd, I'd like to hear about that because that would be very interesting. That probably would be a judicially active decision if it's in contrast with what this, the, the uh, provision of the Constitution says. And Pablo's from Grand Rapids, by the way. Okay, so, great. Michigander. Yes. Um, and then also just one other quick one here. Mark Tiber writes, judges can be impeached and removed. Part of the problem is the fact that we're not impeaching removing justices at any level. Would you agree with that? Is, and is that a problem? Well, so it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, let, there was, I think at the beginning when we adopted the constitution, there were kind of two schools of thought. One was that if judges serve capably, they didn't do anything unethical, they um, uh, went to work and you know they, all that those kinds of things that we're going to keep them there regardless of their decisions and we shouldn't use impeachment as a political tool or as a tool because we don't like the decisions they come up with there was another school of thought that said no we want impeachment because if we have judges that go off the rail we need to be able to remove them and um there was an early supreme court uh, impeachment proceeding um in the early uh, actually late 1700s or early 1800s it was with uh with a justice named chase and he survived the impeachment um and just to give some background thomas jefferson hated judges uh or at least he he hated judges that he thought were trying to usurp the le legislative function very appointed did not like judicial review uh was it he was a, a cousin of john marshall which ironically he john marshall was chief justice that came up with judicial review. So there was a lot of tension there and Jefferson's position lost, but lost in the Senate and ever in that first impeachment. And ever since then, the Supreme Court has basic and, and other justices have not been um, impeached because of the decisions that they make. Should that be revisited? Great question. Uh, that's a political question that judges like me really shouldn't um, uh, dive into. But it's certainly within constitutional authority to say, we don't like your decisions and we're going to impeach you. Just remember the power to do good is the power to do evil. So Congress may be uh, in the hands of people that you like and you getting rid of judges you dislike. And then a few years later, situation may turn. And then the Congress that is a, in your opposing viewpoint and judges that you like are all of a sudden getting tossed off. So. It, it's a, it would be a dangerous precedent, um, but it certainly would be constitutional. Um, all right, I wanna go back to Tova. I, I don't know if it, we, if it was just discussed, and I'm kind of curious, but I wanna turn over to Tova, so much we could discuss. It, I still wanna know about judicial review and the laws of uh, Congress and how that happens. But um, are there any, is there anything for impeachment? Are there any guidelines for impeachment, such as, you know, nothing there's it's wide open it's no. not like a, a mental illness or, or are there any grounds for it or anything so impeachment is an old-fashioned term that came over from the english common law and uh, i it's interesting I've, I've done a podcast on this so um when the presidential impeachment was starting so i want to go to look at uh, 
Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics podcast, you, you can learn a little bit about it. But basically, there, it, it's unfettered discretion. There, there is no constitutional binding of uh, what that means. So it could be for mental illness. It could be because you don't go to work. It could be because you are uh, been in the hospital for 12 months and you can't, you're never going to recover and they want to get, get rid of you. And actually, though, I, I say those things because those were some of the reasons that were posited by the, uh, by the founders when they were drafting. It's like, the only way you can get rid of somebody that's you know, disabled is we're going to have to impeach them. Um, uh, but it can also be for political reasons. It's, it's, it's totally unreviewable by a higher court. And it's totally within the, the power of the, uh, the legislative branches, the political branches. Fascinating. Okay, that's really cool. Tova, what's your next question? Okay, so I was just wondering um, why the founders would have decided to set up the Supreme Court in the way they did with, you know, um, having terms for life. Like, since that is a very unique system, as you mentioned, compared to other countries, and it's also unique compared to a lot of the state courts and stuff like that. And I find it interesting that they chose to make it a lifelong appointment when they just had the Revolutionary War separating from England to protest against monarchy, which is a lifetime appointment, you know, no, and it's very hard to, you can't impeach a monarch, stuff like that. And then they kind of turn around and create a judicial system that has a lot of the same principles. So I was just wondering what, how did they justify that? And then what was, what was their reasoning behind that system? That's a great question. It's very insightful. Um, I think that the, first off, there, there's a couple things we need to remember. Number one, um, they, they knew that it was going to be uh, the least dangerous branch because you, they couldn't go out and do their own thing. They had to have cases brought. Number two, the, the age, um, the term of life was much shorter then. Okay, so, you know, if you were 60, 70, you were really old. I mean, it, it was very unusual to have a, like a Ben Franklin. And, you know, we, th we know some of these founders that were, that were elderly, but the reality was the average age was nowhere near. So you, and they, I think they assumed that people would be appointed that were older. They would serve, you know, 10, 20 years, and then they would die off. Um, now we have a situation where if, if you're, you know, if you're 50, I'm 52, right? So, I'm probably too old to be appointed to the Supreme Court because they want people there for 50 years, you know, 45 years. So um, the politics have changed. But the third reason, kind of the, the um, undergirding rationale, was they really wanted the judges to be independent. And they did not want them to be subject to the, um, to the passions of, um, of current political issues. They, they knew that an independent judiciary was going to be very important to stop um, uh, the loss of rights. And they really were hoping that they would be um, steadfast guardians in protecting those rights. And so, you know, if the, in this example, it's a, it's a case that happened in the 70s, a bunch of Nazis marched through Skokie, Illinois, where there are a bunch of Holocaust survivors. Um, the passions of the day would have said, you cannot do that. That's terrible. It's awful but they have this constitutional right. So often judges are siding on the behalf of uh, very unpopular people, people that um, you know, are murderers, they're rapists, they're, they're, and, and to preserve the integrity so you're not under the passions, then you have that, that uh, lifetime um, tenure. Now maybe, you know, if we, maybe there should be a 20 year term or a 25, something like that. You'd still have that protection and then be able to have people go out. States, um, it's different. Uh, there are some states that have lifetime tenure, but most of them like, they, they like the idea of electing their judiciary. That's kind of a newer phenomenon uh, of the last uh, century, part of the progressive movement where they were making um, elections. They, they, they passed recalls, petition drives, initiatives, and kind of an elected judiciary is part of that. Um, but it's hard, you know, as a judge, um, I never think about if something's popular or not, but I have a, I have some colleagues that have been savaged in social media and on TV and in the newspapers for decisions that were right, but were, were demagogued by really inaccurate and, and um, poor media hype. And these poor people are, you know, savage, 
and they don't have the ability of having this lifetime tenure. So it's, it, it can be very difficult. It was so interesting you brought up the Skokie example. I actually know a lot about that because my mom is from Skokie and they actually experienced that whole controversy firsthand in the 70s when she was growing up. We're Jewish, so it was obviously, you know, come from Holocaust survivors and everything. So it was a huge controversy. I actually have in my room this uh, button that was from the anti-marches, whatever. So I did a whole project about this for History Fair, so I was just very excited you brought that up. <laughs> That's amazing. Small circle of life here. Wow. Listen to that, Tova. Wow. Um, that's so fascinating. I forgot what I was going to. Oh, I, I was going to say I just watched this whole thing about every king throughout England from the, you know, William the Conqueror um, on. And, and before William the Conqueror, uh, it was known that, that the king would be at sort of the will of the people and at the parliament. And William the Conqueror came over and didn't really know the people, so he kind of abided by that. So interestingly enough, throughout all the kings, the king still in England ruled at the will of parliament. And so even though they were sort of lifetime and there was this hereditary thing, they could get rid of the king if they wanted to. And they did, you know, many, many times. So that's probably what they thought Tova, when they were thinking about the Supreme, uh, the judges, is that it's for life, but we can impeach you if we want to. You know, there's that little window. Okay, Dakari. Thank you so much again for all you've been saying. It's been, like I said, fascinating. Um, my question is kind of going back to like separation of powers in a way. But, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, they have separation of powers so that we don't get in this gridlock. But then we have other people that say we have separation of powers to like slow down the pace to ensure that like things don't get out of control and people, you know, and people don't like act off of emotion. What is your opinion on that? Well, the most efficient um, governmental system is, a, is the pharaoh, right? Complete, absolute power, do whatever the heck you want. Uh, that's also the most tyrannical. So we have a separation of powers to ensure that we protect people's rights and that we, um, it takes a lot of people to agree to be able to go forward and create legislation in a certain way, ensure it's enforced fairly and to ensure that it's constitutional. So it's messy, um, it can drive you crazy, make you pull your hair out, but it's clearly the best way to protect our liberties and freedom. In closing the 30, 60 second question, judicial review of a law passed by Congress. How does the Supreme Court step in to say this bill wasn't constitutional? Okay, so somebody files a lawsuit says it's unconstitutional, the district court makes a ruling, it gets appealed to the court of appeals, they make a ruling, then the, the loser files what's called a, 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 an application for a certiorari or an application for leave for it to be heard. Supreme Court takes it and then they make the ruling. Okay, so who usually files the suit? A, a legislator? No, no, Pe anyone that is, who usually files? legislators can't. It has to be somebody that's affected by the law. So like the DACA recipients, it was somebody that was losing their DACA status. Uh, immigration, right. somebody that wants to come in and stay in the country. So it has to be somebody that has standing, somebody that's affected by the law. Okay, cool. I mean, I knew that it had to be filed uh, yeah. to get there, but I never really knew the process. Judge Michael Warren, you're amazing. Thank you so much. We oh, learned so much today. Thank you. You're awesome. Hey, give us a, a last minute pitch for the things you'd like for people to your podcast and everything. Thank you. Well, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to establish new government, laying its foundation such principles and organized power such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Those words from the Declaration of Independence were revolutionary in 1776 and they remain revolutionary today. As we've learned in this discussion, um, we need to understand our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, if we want to preserve our liberties and freedom. Um, about 10 years ago, my then 10 year old daughter and I were having a discussion about the demise of the civic calendar. Uh, we, we had just gone through a holiday that nobody really cared about. It was kind of an empty excuse for a three day weekend and some barbecues. She pounded on the table and said, dad, that's wrong. We need to do something. We need to start a new celebration for America. And I went, whoa. And um, 
that's how Patriot Week got launched. It goes from September 11th, the anniversary of the terrorist attacks, to September 17th, which is the anniversary of the, the signing of the Constitution. Each day we celebrate our founding first principles, key documents and speeches, founding fathers and other great patriots, and flags from our history. Uh, we have been recognized by the U.S. Senate in a unanimous resolution, 17 states. Uh, we have our own cable show called Patriot Lessons, which is on demand at our um, website. We have the podcast I mentioned before, Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics. We have lesson plans for people from all different ages, uh, information about those key documents and speeches. I could go on for hours. I know you don't have time for that. But if you're interested, you can go to patriotweek.org. That's patriotweek.org. You can follow us on uh, social media as well. Um, and also, I've written that book, America's Survival Guide, How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our Founding, First Principles in History. And the reality is uh, we are in a very perilous situation. There is a lot of ignorance out there about our constitution. Uh, so I'm so excited about what Janine and her daughter and everybody else uh, on this call have been doing in connection with Constituting America. It's great to see young people here because um, uh, freedom is not genetic. It's not born in us. We have to learn it. It's, we have to learn it every generation, every day, every year. Um, otherwise we're gonna lose it. And um, uh, with, with our society uh, uh, unraveling as it is, it, it, it's so much more important. And it really is about things that unite us, unalienable rights, limited government, the social compact, equality, the right to alter and abolish an oppressive government, uh, the rule of law. That, that's what unites us as Americans. We can be uh, Democrat, Republican, Green, Libertarian, doesn't matter. We all should believe in those things. And if we can remember what unites us, then we can fight on the edges and we'll, we'll get through it. But if we don't remember what unites us, we're just going to be down the ash heap of history. Uh, so I, I just beg all of you to, to learn your constitution and your declaration and, and fight for those principles. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Michael Warren. God bless you and God bless America too. Thank you so much. We want to thank our sponsor once again, Mr. Mrs. David Finstermaker for making this possible. And if you'd like to sponsor a constitutional chat, you can email me at Kathy, C-A-T-H-Y at constitutingamerica.org.